There's only one point missing that makes this proof, 100% proof, to a scientist that it is the burial cloth of Christ. I'm going to only tell you that at the end, what that one thing is, okay? But every other imaginative part of science, physics, chemistry, photography, light, everything, is all proof to me as a non, trying to be non-prejudiced, scientist, open-minded, all right? But that's what I'm doing. I'm talking science. All right. So first thing that happened to me when I was exposed to the Shroud of Turin is I got mad. Why did I get mad? Because I went to Jesuit High School. I went to Notre Dame. I did all this studying in all these schools. I never heard of the Shroud of Turin. So in 1976, I was over at USF doing internal medicine uh, residency and allergy fellowship, and I'm looking at TV like everybody else. 1976, Shroud of Turin show pops up. What the heck is that? The burial cloth of Christ? I mean, I, I never heard of it. I don't believe it. How come nobody told me about it? What's going on? All right? So what did I do? Did I decide to just throw it out as nonsense? No. I knew because it existed, and I was practicing Catholic, that I had to confront it. I had to confront it as a scientist and decide whether I was going to think it's one of the million pieces of 1,000 crosses or whether it really has some validity scientifically. So I had to approach this from what I know the most about in my whole being, which is allergy, pollen and allergy. All right? So I looked at the shroud studies that were well done, and I convinced myself slowly that the pollen information on the shroud was accurate, could not be faked. Then as a doctor, I looked at the blood and the clots, and I looked at the flow of blood, and I read Barbet's book of 1930-something. And I slowly got convinced and actually got a little chill every night that this scientific object was telling me what in my heart I believed. And it was astonishing that a physical object was proving to me what I already knew was right. And that to me was a first, and I think most of you, if you ever come to this belief, you will say that's the first time a physical object proves that Christ is real, Christianity is real, and everything we believe is real. All right? That's what I'm going to try to do tonight, at least get you interested enough to follow the shroud everywhere, even the, the websites, and slowly come to a belief that you are a lunky bunch of guys that are ex and lad ladies who exist from 2005 forward, all right? Because only at this point, 2005, is it almost irrefutable that this is true, all right? So you know where I stand on that. All right, so let's start out by a semi-scientific statement. I guess you could say it's scientific. The Bible exists, all right? In the Bible, it's true. There is a quote, Joseph of Arimathea bought a, little, a linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in the tomb that had been hewn out of rock. All right? So this is an artist's depiction. Am I blocking the picture? Okay. So this is an artist's depiction of what the moment that the body of Christ, oop, I shouldn't say Christ, the man of the shroud, this is a moment the man of the shroud was wrapped in the linen cloth. So the cloth was laid on the rock, the, the back was laid down, and the top of it was furled over on top. Now you can see his arms are stiff, his legs are stiff, they're actually stuck, and he's nude. So if this was an artist of the medieval time, trying to please the local uh, church authorities, he would have been damned to you know where, because he depicted God Almighty nude. So, so there are absolutely no way that a medieval faker would do the Shroud of Turin in the Middle Ages and show that Christ is nude. All right? So that's the first little thought for your head. All right. So here's what we got to understand. There are thousands of cloths that are 2,000 years old. There are another 500 that are from Egypt that are three or 4,000 uh, years old. And none of them have an image. So everything that's important on the Shroud is the image. Not that it's carbon dated cloth, but I'm going to show you how we're going to throw that out scientifically. And that only happened in 2005. But on it, we have blood and we have an image. The image is everything. It's made out of linen. Now, you have to remember when we're talking tonight that it's made out of linen. It's not made out of cotton. High quality herringbone weave, just like a jacket. Herringbone weave, high quality linen. This is a picture of it. This is the whole thing. 14 feet long, three feet wide. This is the back of his head, back of his back, legs, front of his face, chest, arms, 
So he's head to head because if the body's like this and the cloth wraps around, you're going to have a front image and a back image, and the cloth is only coming over the head. Where the feet are, it's just into air because the cloth which didn't make it all the way around the feet. Okay? So that's what this is. Head to head, image back and front. This is a close-up. Now as we get more detail and closer up, you start to get a little more uh, interested. These are burn marks. Whoops. These are burn marks where there was a fire and uh, it was in a silver casket. Maybe somebody was trying to destroy it, but drips of molten silver burned the holes in. So try to ignore that. Went right through the cloth when it was folded over. So what you can see here is a beard, long scraggly hair, blood up in the scalp, a big water stain where they poured on to put out the fire, arms with blood trickling down, a big clot of blood on his wrist, legs, but look how skinny they are. Look how he doesn't have ears or cheeks. We're going to tell you what 2012 says about that. Here's his back. He's got a ponytail, long, fluffy hair. You see all that hair? Does it look like a hair blower? He took a hair blower while he was dead and blew his hair or somebody did it? That is not matted down, stuck together, bloody hair. That is hair blown hair. I don't hope you can appreciate that. There's over 120 scourge marks here. He's nude. His knees are drawn up in this position. Sorry, I can't raise both legs. But when he, when he died on the cross, and it fits with the Bible, he was there for two hours dead. And in two hours, rigor mortis sets in. You all know what that is, right? Okay. So this body was enveloped in the shroud in a state of rigor mortis with all this evidence, blood coming out of his feet. When I first heard that the Shroud of Turin had all this evidence that masked the crucifixion, I knew it was a fake. How could they do such a convenient thing but put a picture with all the details of the crucifixion? So obviously some you know, very good artist in the 1500s did that to please the local bishop. All right, but not after I started studying it. All right, so we're going to tell you where the shroud has been and why we know it. All right, we have two types of evidence, circumstantial. That means from the time of the crucifixion, approximately to 1357, there is no real proof that the shroud existed except for a few statements in literature, many pictures, and many um, traditions. All right, so I'm going to show you how all that comes together to really make it authentic almost 100%, but not as much as here, 1357 to 2014, when actually it's written down and there are many witnesses. All right? So quickly, this is where it started, obviously, Jerusalem. And during the uh, persecution of the Jews and the uh, Roman destruction of all the temples, around 60, 70 AD, they think it was taken to Edessa, Turkey, and it remained there under the control of the first Christian city king, King Apgar, who was, legend has it, uh, cured of leprosy by the touching the shroud. So at that point in time, he became a Christian. Of course, he's a king, so everybody's a Christian. Too bad, like it or not. So that was the first Christian city. Now, what's, what's important is that there's historical data that maybe two or three generations later, his sons or grandsons took over and reverted to paganism. So at that point, the mentioning of the shroud disappears. So the theory then is the believers hid it, all right? So it disappears until 525 AD, all right? Now, why do we think we know that date? Two things happen in 525 AD. There's an archaeological flood in Edessa, Turkey, all right? And the walls are kind of beat up, falling apart. And the way the story goes, they were trying to fix one of the walls, and inside the wall was a box with a shroud in it. So it was rediscovered. Now, to pin the date to 525, this is going to be very interesting. This is an artist drawing pictures of Jesus' face before 525. Clean shaven, young guy, short hair. These are mosaics in some of the churches in Odessa. All of a sudden, every single painting and mosaic done after 525, this is done in 550, a painting, 
has the image of Christ in an artist's opinion with long hair, beard, mustache, a lot older looking than, than 20, this is 14 years old, this is 32 years old, but a lot older looking, okay? This is actually carbon dated to 550 AD and is a painting that's in the Sinai Peninsula. So from that point to 2014, all of you recognize this as what we think Christ looked like. Before, not, not used to that shot, all right? So what made them do that? They were looking at the face of the Shroud of Turin. All right, this is a uh, digital overlay of the face of the Shroud put in the position of the painting to show that the painter did a mighty good job. So if you put the distance between the middle of his eye here and here, distance between his tip of his nose and his eye, the wideness of his mouth, the distance from his eye to mouth, the distance of his beard, it matches up in 180 points called points of congruence. So the features of the man in this picture matches the shroud man in 180 positions. This can be used in a court of law to prove somebody guilty, and you need about 37 points of congruence, not 180. 550 AD. So that's, you know, it's, I'm not making this up. This is real. So this makes it, to people that study it and understand it, it makes it pretty convincing this has to be something real. All right, so 944 rolls around, and the, uh, the Constantinople, um, the uh, Byzantine era is a very rich city, very powerful city, strong armies, uh, and they were gathering all the relics of the crucifixion. And, but they, had, they didn't have the shroud, but they knew the shroud was in Odessa, Turkey. Fortunately, at that time, the shroud was under the control of the Muslims, who were weak. That's fortunate. When they're, when they're weak, the king of Constantinople sends an army over and says, give me the shroud or you're dead, essentially. So they give up the shroud, and the shroud ends up going to Constantinople from 944 to 1204 in this massive cathedral. And under the, they called it the name of the Mandilion. When it was in uh, Odessa, Turkey, it was in a frame folded up. So all you saw was the face. When it gets to Constantinople, they actually open it up, and they see its full length for the first time. This is an artist's depiction of the face of the man of the shroud, soldier, the, the general, and the king receiving the shroud. All right, now, here we go to some real, almost 100% irrefutable scientific statement. The carbon dating that you haven't heard about, but you heard about the carbon dating said it was a fake, right? Well, if you didn't know, in 1988, carbon dating, which I'm going to tell you was wrong, proved that this was a fake at this point, saying that it was invented, the shroud was put together, the linen harvested out of the ground, somewhere between 1260 and 1390. The linen came out of the ground, all right? So a medieval artist had to paint it. Well, there is a reference in the inside of a Bible that's in Hungary, and this is carbon dated to 1196. Now look at what's on this painting. This is the preparation of the body on Good Friday. This is an artist's picturing of the inside of the Bible, and this is the resurrection scene where the women come and there's nobody coming to anoint. Now, let me show you the details. So this top being anointed ready for, ready for um, burial is a man with crossed arms, long hair, nude, and the big deal is here that cannot happen by accident, he has no thumbs. What would make an artist paint a picture with no thumbs? Why would he randomly try to paint a picture with no thumbs? Why would he in the medi medieval age paint a picture of God nude, okay? Now, now, that's just three of five things, all right? So there you go, no thumbs. I'm going to tell you the explanation in a few minutes. Now, on the bottom half, you have the Shroud of Turin herringbone weave. There's your herringbone weave. And then you have the unbelievable fact that on the Shroud of Turin, there are four burn holes in the shape of an L, and lo and behold, they're on this painting. What would perceive by accident for a man to put four burn holes in the shape of an L on a picture? What would make him draw a picture of a man with no thumbs? You put all these things together, and the man that drew this picture in 1196 had to be looking at the shroud. So for him, one chance in a million that he put all that together by accident. 
All right, so uh, Constantinople unfortunately gets run over by the Roman Catholicism fighting the Greek Catholicism. They destroy the city in the Fourth Crusade, 1204, and the Knights Templar, part of the people that overran the city, we think now have possession of the shroud. And in, in 2009, a Vatican archivist, Barbara Frail, saw a quote that said, in 1287, the Knights Templar worshiped a bearded man. So the theory is it was in their possession, the Knights, 1204 to 1357. And they're part of the team that overran Constantinople. All right, so that's the end of the supposition. This is the fact now. 1357, depicted in white, the shroud appears in Lyrae, France, moves to Chambéry, and then finally moves to Turin, where it is now. So why is it in Lyrae, France? Because the owner, first owner to ever show the shroud in public was the, was the son of a knight Templar that was at the right age to be there for the overtaking of Constantinople. So the theory goes that the, his name is uh, Geoffrey de Charnay, is part of the receiver of the shroud when they took all the, all the good relics out of uh, Constantinople. And his son, same name except Geoffrey de Charnay II, was the first to have public showings. Then it got back to the Pope in a few years and he felt it was all real, so he issued a papal bull that it would be a complete indulgence to visit it. So, the visitors used to come from all over Europe to visit the shroud so they could get an indulgence. Well, what do we have here? We have a souvenir from one of the visits. This is a piece of metal that's about five inches by six inches, and it contains the front and back image of a head-to-head -head new man, dude man. So this has got to be the shroud. And on here are the family coats of arms of Charnay and De Verger. And this is dated to 1357. But now we have some solid proof the shroud exists. All right, now, I'm going to connect more history than we'll get done with the history, but this is very important because this connects to what I'm going to tell you is the proof that the Shroud of Turin carbon dating was wrong. We get down to the granddaughter of the first owner, Margaret of Austria. She died and she built the church in Chambéry, but she said, I need to have a piece of the Shroud put in my church. So she wills in her will to have a piece cut out, and you know we never knew if that happened, but their paintings of that error that show this giant rectangle with a corner missing. So the theory then is, is the painter of the day was looking at the shroud in that condition because her little corner was missing and there's the corner piece missing. All right, now just keep in your brains now for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes from now when I tell you what happened in that corner. All right, so the shroud then goes to Turin, Italy, where it presently is near, um, um, what's the name, Milan and was not under the ownership of the Vatican or the Pope until 1985. That's kind of shocking. So the, the church had to get permission from the King of Savoy to do anything. So here's the, the king right before he died, giving the shroud to the owner, new owner, and now the only owner of the shroud now is the Pope. This is where it's kept in Turin, Italy, in St. John the Baptist Cathedral, and it's in a bomb-proof glass case with argon gas, not atmosphere. So it can't degrade from the atmosphere, can't oxidize. All right, now, that's a little quick history. Now we're gonna to get to science. This, everything I tell you now, if this lady was a physicist right here, and she was an atheist, and she was honest, she'd have to say, I agree with you, Dr. Phillips, but I just don't believe. That's the best that an honest atheist scientist can tell me. All right, so what happens in 1898? Somebody takes a picture of it. Photography is invented. So they take a picture. Now you look at the picture, what you see is a very light background and a dark face. So anybody that's ever had film over at Eckerd's knows when you take your film in, you turn it in and you get a negative back. And if it's your picture, your face is dark and your background is light. But you're not looking at the print, you're looking at the negative. So the shrouded turn image has all the characteristics of a photographic negative. That is really weird if some guy in 1500 did it, 400 years before they invented photography, all right? So that's the characteristics of the image. Now, you haven't seen anything yet. He goes back to the dark room, nobody under 20 knows what that is, and he turns in <laughs> the film, and he does a negative of a negative to get a print or a positive, all right? So when you take a negative of a negative of the shroud, you get 
this. This is a much more impressive image of the face of the man of the shroud. You know, you can see really details of the hair, the eyebrows, the eyes, the nose, the mustache. And if you're close enough, you can perceive two rows of teeth. And just a little hint on what made the image, his mouth is closed. His mouth is closed, you're looking at his teeth. Hint, hint. All right, so what do we have here? We have a beard that looks like it's been plucked. We have a majorly swollen right cheek and lots of blood up here. There is the positive, which is a negative, actually a photographing negative. And when you make a negative, it becomes a positive. So right now, the fact that this is a photographic negative already makes it unbelievable that somebody in 1500 could do this. All right, 1931, the cameras get better. And you got this. I did not fake this. I'm just, this is a picture in a book. This is real. This is the best picture up until 1970 something, 1931. Much more detail of his face. All these are scourge marks. All these are scourge marks. There's trickling blood. There's the left wrist. Now, what's interesting is when you do a negative, you're, you're looking at an image that's the same as a person that you could shake his hand. So the orientation of his left arm is what a real person would be. So that is his right arm. That is his left arm. His left is over his right. This is his back. These are all the scourge marks. There's his ponytail, typical Jewish style of hair, ponytail. And all look at all this hair here. It's just all nice and hair blown. Keep that in mind when I tell you how the image got made. A hair blower did that. Scalp blood, long hair, and there's those little L-shaped burn holes I was telling you about. And there's those knees pulled up. All right, now, that's 1931. Nothing happens until 1976. Why? Because the Vatican was chicken. This has been videotaped. Okay. So they were properly chicken because they didn't want to trust this object to anyone. They had to believe somebody knew what they're doing. So I am proud to say that the people that knew what they were doing in 1976 was the United States of America, NASA. So NASA had a gadget that they put in the satellites. It was called the VP8 Image Analyzer. And it would scan the surface of Moon or Mars, and it would tell by degradations of color, lighter gray, darker gray, darker black, lighter. And they would tell you whether the mountain was 10,000 feet, 4,000 feet, or the valley was 3,000 feet, whatever. It could tell you by the gradations of color. All right, so this machine was in, under the possession of the NASA team. And then a physics professor of the United States Air Force Academy, Dr. John Jackson, took the 1931 photograph negative, photographic, I mean the positive of the, of the shroud, and put it under the VP8. This is a natural light photo of the shroud image that he put under the VP8, just to see what would happen. Now what is that? That's a 3D image. That is a 3D image, okay? He was completely shocked. So this shock is as good as the other shock of the photographic negative shock. But this shock reverberated all the way to the Vatican. And they heard about it and they said, hmm, United States, pretty smart, got some good scientists. Maybe it's time to open up and let them touch the shroud. That's what they did. Here's the whole body, 3D. And only a, the picture of the shroud is the only thing on Earth that has 3D encoded information. All right, now I'm going to show you some examples. This is a picture of a young lady. Put it under the VP8 image analyzer, and you get this distortion. So there is no information in a normal, everyday picture that works in 3D when you put it under the VP8 image analyzer. All right? Now, about four years ago, they got the computers in on it, and they put different levels, like a CAT scan, and they looked at the gradations, and they made a 3D image of it. And this is actually what a hologram is. So not only is it 3D information, but it has the information to make a hologram. You know what a hologram is? It's, it's a flat card that you look at and you swear everything in is 3D and you stick your finger through it. Okay, so that's what the shroud has. Hologram 3D information that the guy in 1450 invented. The, the joke in the shroud people, the real scientists, their joke is, if, if God made this, it's a small miracle. If a man made this, it's a huge miracle. 
All right, so here was the STIRP team in 1978. The Vatican asked them to put the American team together to come st uh, study the shroud. Forty scientists, Los Alamos, NASA, U.S. Air Force Academy, Jet Propulsion Lab, all these scientific disciplines were represented. They all got in a plane and took off to Turin, Italy. Now, interesting, let's hear about who they were. Three were raised Catholic. Sorry, mostly Protestants. 36 raised Protestant, one Orthodox Jew. Very important point. All 38 were not quite sure there was a God, Christianity, or anything. They were agnostics. They had probably had faith earlier, but they were slipping. Two were believers. All believed the shroud itself was a fake because they had never seen it or touched it. And a scientist is trained, just like you get trained at Jesuit High School, to be a skeptic. All right? You don't believe anything until you figure it out. All, right? all left Turin, Italy, not saying this was God's image, but saying honestly as a scientist, the shroud image is not a fake. We can't figure out how it got there. We know what it is, but we can't figure out how it got there. So we can't say it's a fake. All right? So what are some, now we're going to talk about the image itself, which is the most important thing. Now, before we get to the image, we're going to talk about things that I know a little bit about, non-image. All right, now what do I know a lot about? Pollen. All right, so this is kind of what got me going, okay? Because this is what I'm an expert on. In Jerusalem, there are three types of pollen that don't exist anywhere else on the earth on the shroud. All right, three types that are only in Jerusalem on the shroud. Fourteen types that only exist in Israel on the shroud. 58 types, there were just what I just gave you, it's a little history. Constantinople, France, Turkey. Odessa, Turkey, Constantinople, Lyra, France. All right? There's no pollen from any place else on it. And the pollen is unique. The, the pollen in uh, Tampa, Florida is different than the pollen in Atlanta and North Carolina. And I deal with that all the time. So it took that thing to, to start convincing me something's on with a shroud. All right? This is very interesting. Look at that pollen. That looks a little scary. Well, you should be because that is the pollen of a thorn plant. And the name of the thorn plant that exists only in Israel is Gundelia turniforti. On the shroud, this is the most represented pollen of all the other 58 species. There's more of that than anything else. But what do you think that came from if it had little sharp objects in the plant itself? Okay, the theory is that this plant made up the crown of thorns. All right. Now, when they got there to Turin, the blood on the shroud was not black, like all of them expected being forensic experts. It was reddish. It looked way too red. So they're all looking at it from, you know, 15 feet like, what? That's just paint. That's some kind of fake stuff. So when they got closer and studied it, obviously they changed their mind. But this is now three months later. I'm going to jump ahead because they took blood samples home and they studied it. And they figured out the blood type on the shroud is AB, which is a rare type in the world, you know that. But in the Sephardic Jews, there is a higher percentage than in the rest of the world. Now, this you probably never heard of. All right, so in the primate family, which we say we are members of, there is another marking system for red blood cells, M and S. M and N are part of the primates, the gorillas, the monkeys, all that. But the S marker is only in humans. The blood on the shroud has M and S. So the faker in the 1500s did not put monkey blood all over the shroud when he was faking it, all right? It had to be human blood. I don't know who, you know, said I'd give up some blood. The white blood cells mixed in the blood do have the X and Y chromosome, which can be easily identified. The mama and the data chromosome. Is there, is there a priest here? There's no priest here. I can't tell you where the Y came from. All right. So the good news is DNA is also not in a perfect form that you can clone another person out of that DNA. So we're not going to have Jesus 2 and Jesus 3 to worry about. It's degraded DNA. Never was. No, I can't say never because science is who knows. All right. So now you're looking at the red blood cells of who? The man of the shroud. You're looking at the red blood cells of if I stepped outside of my science talk, Jesus, jump back in. That is his red blood cells. This is the two red blood. 
all over the fibers of the shroud. So why is it too red? Because blood contains a colorful product in it called bilirubin. And in all red blood cells, bilirubin is what makes blood red. Now, if you beat somebody up and torture them like crazy, you're breaking the red blood cells that are in his circulation. You're just smashing them, and they're leaking out bilirubin into his intact circulation. So when that bilirubin goes up in the blood, the other red blood cells that have not been broken down absorb the bilirubin, so the content of the remaining blood cells that have not broken goes higher and higher and higher with bilirubin. So when it finally bleeds out, it's way redder. They didn't know that for three months. That's how long it took for them to figure out why the blood wasn't black. It's filled with bilirubin. So now we go back to the medieval forger. He had to use human blood, but he had to also know about bilirubin so he could torture the guy, beat up his blood so it had more bilirubin. Really smart guy. All right, now we get to the most interesting part of this whole talk for me. This is stepping outside of science. This is an image of Jesus, in my belief, that was a miracle. But the good news is, between 1978 and 2014, I'm going to be able to tell you what all the smart guys have been able to tell me. How's this image happen? Can you believe I just said that? How this image had to happen according to the knowledge we have, of course I have to put that preface, according to the knowledge we have of physics, chemistry, and photography. All right. So when this Turin, when the Strata Turin group from America got done, they proved, which was earth shaking, the shroud is not a painting, not a drawing, not a rubbing, not a, a, a sheet laid over a hot statue to burn it, because every burn on a cloth fluoresces under fluorescent light. There's no fluorescent of this image, not a photograph, and not a bleaching. So when they proved that, what's left? What's left is, I don't know. 1976 science saying, I don't know. All right, here's a microscopic close-up of the fibers of the shroud. Do you see any paint here? No. This is a, a spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is a, is a microscope that's aiming light at a target, and the light bounces back, and the microscope picks up the colors red, yellow, green, and the computer tells you where that bounce comes from carbon or sulfur or mercury, and it tells you what element is, the light is bouncing back from, all right? So when they aimed the spectroscopy waves of light against the image, what came back? Nothing. Nothing bounced back but linen. The image is not made out of anything that bounces back in the wavelength of spectroscopy. Then they said, all right, let's try x-rays. So, you know, if you turn an x-ray real, real high, it goes through the bone. It won't go through lead. But if you turn it down weaker, you can get it weak enough that it won't go through blood. So blood stops the x-ray when the power is turned down. So when the power is turned down, this is the rest of the image of the body of the man of the shroud, and there's nothing there. Because the x-ray goes through it, it's nothing there. All right? Now I'm going to tell you why the shroud is a 3D image, why the image, if one fiber was this big, the image takes place on the first inch of a cable this big. The image does not penetrate this cable. It only sits on the surface. It's superficial. That's kind of, how could it be superficial? And the image is finely focused like a photograph. We now know why. All right, bear with me here a little bit. Here's the man of the shroud. Here's the blue shroud. Here's the points of contact, forehead, nose, chin, chest, hands knees, toes. At the points of contact, the image is the strongest and the darkest. So whatever came out of that body would, of course, be stronger where it was touching. But what makes this not be just an oozing of a diffuse gas is it jumps four or five inches and still leaves an image. So if a gas comes out of something and goes far four or five inches, how can it remain focused? All right? So it was not a gas. It was not touching. So whatever made the image darker at the touching and not quite as dark further away was a radiation of some kind. Now, of course, we don't know what radiation, but it had to be radiation because it had to jump space. Whatever happened to this body gave off radiation, it had to jump space. 
So that is why it's 3D, because the closer to the, to the uh, shroud, the darker the image and the further away the lighter. So it's like the, a mountain. It's like the top of the mountain or the bottom of the mountain. So that it's filled with encoded 3D information because of that. Did you get it? Okay. All right, now, this is a single fiber. One fiber of the shroud. It's made out of fibrils, B-R-I-L-S, fibrils. So there's 200 fibrils that make up every fiber. The image depth is one micron, so it makes up two fibrils. So that much distance is the image, and everything all the way down, the image power radiation never even reached it. This is a close-up of the intertwining fibers. Here is radiation, aging, darkened linen fiber, and right next to it, no radiation. So when you have something so small and such a stark contrast, you get a photograph. You look in the old days in the newspaper, I guess they still do it, and you look at the photograph, you can see the dots if you take out a little magnifying glass. So that's what this is. This is dot, not dot, dot, not dot, and that's what makes a picture. In the world of the uh, computer, we call it pixelation. I don't remember what they called it in the newspaper days. All right, now they look at the fibers and they look at the microscopic fibers and they see non-image, not cooked, ready to be cooked celery, and here cooked celery. So something happened that heated up the surface here that made it age. It broke the carbon carbohydrate molecule bonds and made it age. It oxidized it. And that's what they found out in 1976 by American scientists. They also found out that in every position where the blood is, Underneath the blood, there's no image. So again, proving that the radiation was so focused, so finely controlled, that it was weak and couldn't go through blood. Radiation can't go through blood. It couldn't go through blood because underneath the blood, there's no image. The spots where there's no image, the shroud is untouched. All right? Now, here's the part that made me think that the shroud is just too convenient. It matches the Bible. What the heck's going on here? It has to be fake. So Jesuit again is telling me, doubting Thomas, this is not true, it's all fake. Here's what's on the shroud. Swollen cheeks and nose, crown of thorns, scourging, areas to prove where he carried the cross, nails in his hands, single nail and lance on the side. Now, all this is there. Now, if you are the smartest person that ever lived and you want to tell a lie, this is the best way you could do it because not all of this is exactly what you think it is. It's a little bit off of reality. So it's not quite a crown of thorns. It's not quite carrying the whole cross. It's not quite nail in the hands. So to convince somebody because you're super smart, you always tell them, but you give a little twist to make it sound wrong. Okay? Well, that's what a smart, there's nobody ever lived that's smart. That's smart. All right? So if somebody faked this, they would carry out exactly what the Bible says. They're not going to draw a picture that disagrees with the Bible, right? In 1500, it's for them. All right, so here we go. Swollen cheek, broken nose. Evidence, beat up. Cap of thorns, not a crown of thorns. There is no way that a Roman uh, soldier with all his masculinity got a big hunk of thorns and did a little basket weaving of a crown, all right? No way. That's an artist's depiction. That's what we're used to. They got a big hunk of uh, Gundelia Tornaforte and slapped it on his head, hit it with a piece of wood, and have over 18 puncture holes all over the top of his head, front and back. This is, a, this is actually the, the plant. This is in the Museum of Turin. This is Gundelia Tornaforte, um, uh, barbed plant, thorns. All right, position of scourging. scourging. Tall man hitting from one side, a shorter man from the other, took turns, right, left, right, left. Very efficient. There are no scourge marks on his hands and lower arms because he was in this position. So that's pretty nice. But you can look at the shroud and actually picture almost exactly what happened. So the Passion of the Christ, you saw the movie, is pretty darn close. They must have consulted some experts on the Shroud of Turin. This is the instrument they use, a Roman flagrum, leather with lead barbells on each side. And here is a close-up of all the scourge marks. There is the ponytail, and those are the, the marks on the back of the scalp. Now here's a life-size photograph of the back where the barbells of the flagrum fit perfectly into the scourge, scourge marks that are in the shape of a barbell. 
All right, now, here's the first disagreement with all the, no, the second disagreement with all the pictures and crucifixes and everything. So Christ could never, no human being could ever carry the entire cross after losing two-thirds of his blood and being beat to a pulp. So there's no way he can manage carrying the stipes, the upper part. He can only carry the patabulum, and that weighed over 100 pounds. And it was tied to his arms, because he didn't have any nails at this point, by ropes. Now, how do we know that from the shroud? There are scratch marks running this way, all over his back, so that the board would have been right here. And the scourge marks are going all kinds of ways. All right, so those are friction abrasions. Okay, this is another thing. Now, this is going to convince any Downing Thomas in this room that this is an authentic burial cloth of the man of the shroud, which I'm going to not call Christ just yet. All right, so everything you've ever seen in a painting or crucifix has a nail on the palm of the hand, all right? That is physically impossible to hold up a 170, 80 pound person because there's nothing there between that nail and just flesh. There's no bone, there's no support structure, all right? So the, sh the shroud shows that. This is fingers and that is a wrist. This is a position of the wrist where the nail went in. These are his, uh, meta, his carpals and his metacarpals. So it looks like long, long fingers, but what you're really seeing is the whole bone all the way back to the wrist. Here's the um, I right hand, and there's no thumb. Now pay attention to this, because that's going to match that Hungarian prey manuscript, and there's no thumb, all right? Where is the thumb, okay? The thumb is not there because when you put a nail here, it goes through and it cuts the median nerve. The median, M-E-D-I-A-N, nerve controls the motor muscles of the thumb. So when it's bisected, it goes into spasm and it hides behind the hand. So when the image is created, you see the whole hand, but you can't make out the thumb because it's hidden in this mess here. All right? That's called desktop space. You want to find out where it is on you? Stick the back of your hand, push around your wrist connection right about there, and you're going to feel a circle of nothing where there's no bone, that's called desktop space, and that's a nice convenient place to whack a nail that'll go right through without bouncing off and the Romans got to go chase the nail somewhere and do it again. So they knew where to put the nail, desktop space. And there's where it's put between the metatarsals, another nail. And the, uh, so I got to see these nails in uh, the, the Museum of Turin. We went to see it, my wife and I, when it was under exposition in 2010. The shroud was under exposition. And by the way, it's going to be back under exposition 2015 because Pope Francis loves the shroud. Now, he hasn't said it's the very close to Christ, but instead of waiting from 2010 to 2025, he has jumped it by 10 years. You haven't heard the announcement yet. It's going to be April 2015. Next time, it's going to be available for everybody to see it. So, that you, so what this nail does is you can hit it with a glancing blow sideways and the cap comes off. So if the cap comes off, it's easy to get the person off the cross to get to the next crucifixion. So here's a nail going through the foot, and all over the bottom of the foot is travertine aragonite, which is the dirt of the crucifixion area and the tomb entombing area. That is the dirt there. And that dirt matches the, if you go get a sample from that area and you match it electronically, it matches up. But that was all over the shroud. Now, was it, could you see it with your eye? No, well, only with a microscope. So the guy, again, with that, before the microscope was invented, was sprinkling little dirt by the feet, so he could confuse the heck out of us in the 20th and 21st century. All right, now we got the spear between the fifth and the sixth rib of an already dead man of the shroud. So to understand this, this is going to be good for the Bible, because it's exactly what the Bible says. When you put blood drawn out of your body into a test tube and you don't let air touch it, what happens in two hours is the red blood cells sink to the bottom. What stays at the top is called plasma not serum. Serum is what happens when air hits blood and the blood clot retracts and what's left is serum. So this is in a test tube. So this is now bleeding into the pleural space above the lung. That's a potential space. It's like a potential sac where when somebody's tortured, you leak blood into that sac and it fills up. So the whole sac of the pleural space fills up with blood. He dies. Two hours later, the red blood cells go to the bottom and sit there. The plasma goes to the top. The soldier puts the, the spear in, and what do you get? Do you get water first? No. 
You get blood and water. Exactly what the Bible says. And here's watered down blood leaking all over the shroud out of the right side of the image of the body of the man of the shroud. Now, I was talking about the medieval guy. I hate to beat him to death. But he also had UV fluorescent light in his possession. Because only a scientist in the 20th century knows what that is. And you can only see the serum line of the blood that dried. The blood dried, it formed a clot. And what's left is this yellow stuff that is serum and fluoresces with UV light. Otherwise, your eye cannot perceive it at all. So this guy is getting smarter and smarter. OK, so here's an autopsy of the man in the shroud. He's laying on the slab. 5 foot 11 inches tall, 170 pounds, 30 to 35 years old, major abrasion on his back right shoulder, severely scourged, beaten on the right cheek, scalp bleeding greater than 18 bleeding sites, nailed through the wrist, not the palms, thumbs are missing, feet nailed together, pierced through the right side of the chest in a state of rigor mortis. That is all over the shroud. That is just to me overwhelming. All right, so we're all happy campers. It's 1978, 100 studies are published, peer-reviewed, the best journals of the world. Everybody believes it's authentic. This is the Shroud of Turin until 1988. The church gets pushed correctly, has to give in, and gets it carbon dated. All right, that is a disaster. Now I'm going to tell you what happened. Oh, this is the guys that did the carbon dating, the heads of the three labs. The Stroud is 1260 to 1390, ha ha. That's exactly what they look like they're saying here. Now, I'm just making that up. That is not scientific, right? Do you agree with me or what? They look pretty darn smug and happy. So the whole world now knows the Shroud is a fake. But unfortunately, the scientists from America believe this too. All right? So they shut down. And me, I'm devastated. I'm saying what a dupe I was. I believed all these other facts, and now carbon dating has proven the shroud is real. All right? What little being inside of me said, maybe something else happened, and there's something wrong with the carbon dating. You know, I kept saying it, but I didn't have the nerve to call up the scientists, write letters to them, actually beat them to death with my ideas. But these people did. These are the real, true people with faith. And the shroud scientists from America had to deal with them with all their suggestions on what was wrong with the carbon dating for 13 years. And they called them all the wonderful name, the lunatic fringe. Because in everything they said didn't make any sense. These are high level scientists, okay? But they dealt with it, all right? One day, August 2001, a member of the lunatic fringe, Sue Benford and Joe Marino, hit a home run. That's Sue. She was watching TV in 1997, and she heard of the Shroud for the first time, and that's her husband, Joe Marino. And she said, she wasn't even a Catholic. I don't even know if she was a Christian. She said, I think this is real. I think this is real. And she has more determination than anybody I ever heard of, because for one to two years, she got copies of photographs of the piece of cloth that was put under carbon dating and kept staring at it. Here's what she saw. This is the cloth that was cut off for the carbon dating. This was published 2001, I mean, noticed in 2001, published in 2008. She died about that time. So on the right side, you have something that is not the same as on the left. So I'm going to point this out to you because you never would figure this out looking at it without me pointing it out. Do you feel that there is closer and many more full white tufts of cotton lined up here, and these are scraggly little beat up tufts of cotton. Do you feel that the, the alleyways between this cotton is skinnier and the alleyways over here are thicker and bigger and wider? Do you have that feel? Okay, that's because I pointed it out. So right down the middle is where she proposed a weaving was done. So you remember the Austria lady who took the piece out and cut it? OK, so she developed a theory that what was actually sent for carbon dating was a combination of a medieval patch job, 100% cotton, mixed with linen of the year whatever, zero. All right, here's a close up. There's those big tufts of cotton, and there's those skinny little rail, and there's those beat up tufts of cotton and the big thick rail. Now you can see it better, right? 
Okay? So that's what got her interested. So she went to textile experts in New York, and they said, you're right, I think it's a uh, French uh, in-weaving or re-weaving. So she goes back to the original carbon dating moment in Turin. International protocol, all the American scientists, Italians, French, Germans, everybody said, go over the whole shroud and take six samples, six different places. Then you'll get it right. The Turin scientist and cardinal at the last second Took, threw that whole protocol out the window and took one sample site only. Huge mistake. Not necessarily because of the one samples, because where they chose. They chose to take it right up in the corner where that little patch job was, and it's actually about the size of this red marker that was taken right out of here, not here. That's still missing. That's an undercoating of cloth underneath the shroud. The shroud is missing this still. So they took it right here, all right? Close to where there could have been a lot of activity. All right, and this guy, the original chemist from uh, Los Alamos, who studied the shroud back in 1978 with the American team, did a study from 2001 to 2005 after listening to Sue Benford, who by the way was a nurse, not a physicist, not a doctor, we're too dumb. Okay, but guess what? The dumb nurse and the dumb doctors are the ones that, I, I wasn't a doctor, but the nurse is one that thought of all this. So a nurse gets the credit, calls up the high-level scientist, he gets intrigued after first telling her he didn't believe any of it, gets back on the phone and says, I think you're right, because he had samples left over from the C14 dating, he had samples from 1976 when they had a few threads, and uh, some from 1978 when they had other threads. So he publishes, after getting other people to help him, and four years of study in Thormochyma Acta, published in January 2005, that what was actually sent to the lab to be dated was a match, a, a match, um, a mis, a, re, a remending of the shroud with cotton put together with a linen. And here in the microscope, we see cotton fibers and linen fibers mixed together, and more impressive is end-to-end -end sticking one fiber sticking to another. This is cotton, this is linen. That's how good they were. Remember, this was a potential 1500s when this reweaving took place, and the French had the best uh, uh, tapestry weavers of the world, so they could easily could have done this patch job. They could have taken a secret piece and put a patch job. The king could have done it. And here is cotton dyed to look yellow. Cotton, you know, is white. And linen, end-to-end -end fibers with all the little fibrils, and another original linen and a little over dyeing of the medieval cotton. Okay, that's how good they were. So, this is the sample. Over here, this was still, this still exists in Turin, Italy. They haven't done anything with it, it's reserved. This is what was sent to the three labs, three different carbon 14 labs. So, they, they dated it somewhere between 1238 and 1430. This is a reweaving. A, a cotton area, and this is the original linen area, and as you go left to right, it gets to be more and more cotton. That's why the date keeps going younger and younger. All right, so what happened in 2005 is absolute proof, everybody's happy, the shroud is back. Carbon-14 labs, they did a good job, they were given a bad sample. So the O-axiom, garbage in, gar garbage out. Sample was flawed, a reweaving was responsible. So enthusiasm was restored from then to now. Now I'm going to tell you everything that happened to the shroud to 2014 that'll blow your mind away that what we really think happened at the moment of the resurrection. All right, so this is published, starts to be published at Ohio State University Conference on the Shroud. They're going to have one in St. Louis, uh, 2014. I'm going, of course. 2008, I'm not presenting anything, I'm just listening. All right, so we have a cloth. We know what the cloth is. The cloth has an image on it. So we have to make a guess, we have to do something, and what does science do? Because they're given an unknown, they have to prove with the knowledge they present have, their knowledge of physics, knowledge of chemistry, knowledge of photographic principles, what the heck, how the image got on this route. All right, here's what we're dealing with. No ears, no cheeks, hair that's flying off into space, looking drone, uh, blown by a hairdryer. We have um, teeth sticking through the lips, and we have blood in the hair, but not all over the face. All right? So the fact that the blood is in the hair, not in the face, is pretty odd because face bleed, hair doesn't. And I'm going to explain why. 
All right, so this crazy slide is what we now know since 2005 the image is made out of. It has no image under the blood. That means it was weak energy. The energy is perpendicular. And the perpendicular means the body's here, the shroud's above and below. So the, whatever the radiation was had to come in a straight line. Okay, and I'm going to show you a little more detail about that. And it's superficial, and it's 3D, and it breaks carbon bonds, and it has no directionality. That means when you look at a photograph of a person, you always know where in the room the light was that hit the body. Okay? The light in the shroud came from inside the body. It did not come from outside the body. The only way is it came from the inside. It has no edges, so a painter would have to put an edge before they draw a body. There's no edge. The edge of the shroud image just kind of falls away and disappears. The cloth, you can't even see the image when you get four or five inches away. It disappears. Um, you've got to be three feet away to see it, to see the difference in the subtleness between the light yellow and the little bit darker yellow. That's all it is. All right, so here's our problem. We got a man in a tomb with a cloth covering him tightly, and all the blood's leaked into the cloth, and it's sticking to him. All right? Now, what we got to do is get him out of that shroud without breaking the blood clots, because every blood clot is pristine with perfect edges and hasn't been touched. There's an example. There is a blood clot, no broken edges, pieces of it go, didn't go stick into the cloud because the man of the shroud stood up and took the shroud off. That would have ripped all of it. You've bled into your shirt before, right? And, and pulled your shirt and the blood sticks, right? Okay, so you know that that's not possible, that that blood's going to stick everywhere, all right? So he's draped tightly, the blood is embedded in the fibers. All right, now, the next point. When the image is made, it has to be photographically clear and look like a real person. So the image has to be made by the photographic plate not wrapping him tight. So if the linen is the photographic plate, it can't be wrapping him tight. It has to be flat. So if it's not flat, you get cylindrical distortion, and that's what he looks like. If you get it flat, you have the image we have. So the shroud had to be flat. So this is the only way that our knowledge of science and physics today, this may change next year, that the resurrection had to happen. First, the shroud had to unwrap in a way that the clots didn't break off. The image went up and down. All the image that came out of this body that was turning into energy, of course, came out at 360 degrees, but there's nothing on the sides and nothing on the feet. So remember I said there was no ears and no cheek because all that energy that turned into an image went this way. You know, it's coming off in all directions. So the image, the image only went perpendicular. And the body doesn't weigh anything. Because if you look at the image of the man of the shroud, there's no pressure on his legs and, and rear end and back that, like you would expect all that weight on a hard rock. There's totally uh, curves. There's no, no uh, pressure. The clutch had to detach, undisturbed from the body, no gravity. Shroud unwraps. The body does not move inside the cloth. All right, so here's the body. Here's the cloth. And there's all the body turning into energy with all the particles uh, electrons, protons, neutrons, whatever makes up the atom, coming off in 360 degrees and going, you know, who knows where. That's what we think happened. And what is that? It's called dematerialization. So we do that when we set off atomic bombs. So we know dematerialization happens every time there's an atomic explosion. The mass of the, the um, ra radium versus the, the square of the velocity of light equals the energy relieved. So all the matter of that body turned into pure energy and went somewhere. All right? I'm not kidding. That's exactly what happened. Star Trek had it figured out a long time ago. All right? His physical atom image turned into energy and went somewhere. Well, we're not going to figure out exactly how that happened, but we sure know how that event affected the shroud surface. That's what we know. So, the preponderance of the evidence, enough to convict somebody in a court of law, is overwhelming. All these details, put them all together. Is this a fake because carbon dated said it was made in the Middle Ages? Or is the carbon dating wrong and the other hundred things I said are accurate? 
Don't you have a problem figuring out that if we're so smart in the 21st century, we still don't know what made the image? That's convincing that it is not in our capability. And the image had to be a form of radiation, and we may be 500 years from now before we know it. So this is what God, Jesus, said. Look closer. I have given truth into the world. Bring it into the light. Now, I am done. I want you to go to out there and read more about it and carry this image in your mind and make it real and tell everybody about it. So thank you very much, and I'm opening the floor to questions.